This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. And once again, from UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm one of your hosts, John Williams. And I'm Steph Dewar. Uh, I'm Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs and the Co-Director of the Pediatric Residency Training Program. And I'm the Division Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And today we're thrilled to have with us Dr. Andrew Nowak, uh, who in addition to being a medical doctor is also a PhD. He's Associate Professor of Pediatrics at University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and he's a member of the Division of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Nowak, welcome. We're so happy to have you here with us. Thank you for the invitation this morning. I appreciate the opportunity. So you, um, Andy, um, have a lot of varied interests, and and I'm just wondering if you could maybe, you know, uh, let us in on what's the latest with uh, the infectious disease recommendations um, nationwide or things that you're seeing here at Children's that folks might be interested So yes, Steph, I wear many different hats here. In my clinical interests, one of the things I've had a long interest in since my um, fellowship days is Lyme disease. Uh, I am in the interesting position of having started doing basic science research in Lyme. I have a PhD in microbiology. And then while I was doing that basic science research, Uh, we have had an epidemic in Western Pennsylvania of Lyme disease. So we in our group and me as a clinical and laboratory researcher have had the opportunity to watch an epidemic happen, which has been fascinating from a scientific point of view. And we've been able to describe a lot of very interesting things that happen to children with Lyme disease. We published some papers this year in Clinical Infectious Disease and some other journals about our experience. And I think we're learning important lessons here in Western PA. I would say that what's new and innovative is more so what the Red Book has done this year. And so for those of you who are listening who are engaged in primary care pediatrics or see patients in the emergency uh, room setting or are in parts of the country where children get hospitalized for Lyme disease, if you open up your 2018 Red Book, what you'll find are some significant changes in the Red Book recommendations for the treatment of Lyme disease that actually have gone ahead of the Infectious Disease Society of America recommendations. So the IDSA, which is what John and I uh, belong to as a professional association, has a longstanding set of uh, recommendations from 2007 for the treatment of Lyme disease. And those have been pretty much mirrored by the Red Book for the last uh, 10 years or so. The Red Book in 2018 came out and changed some significant recommendations. And probably the one that will be the most surprising to folks is a universal recommendation for the use of doxycycline under the age of eight in children with Lyme disease-associated facial nerve palsy. This is a big change for our traditional teaching because both of you probably remember from medical school, anything that ends in cycling stains your teeth. So you should never use that in a child under the age of eight unless they're in dire circumstances. One of the good examples John and I would, would know would be Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It could kill the patient, so patient first, teeth second in that situation. Well, the Red Book this year um, went ahead um, based on some data from European studies primarily, but also some U.S. data, uh, and made a recommendation that for facial nerve policy specifically, any child in any age can be treated with doxycycline. So that that's a pretty surprising recommendation. It is based on a lot of data in the last 10 years that have started to destroy the connection between doxycycline specifically and tooth staining. The, the data on tetracyclines old and good. Tetracycline definitely can stain your teeth. Doxycycline, even in the early days of appreciating the link between tetracycline and and dental staining, was not thought to have the same capacity. And in some studies that have been done in uh, Israel in 2007, and more recently some U.S. studies looking at kids who've received multiple courses of doxycycline for the treatment of presumed Rocky Mountain spotted fever have found no increased incidence of dental staining. We are becoming more and more comfortable with the fact that it can be used for short courses in children under the age of eight and see no appreciable dental staining. There's a little bit of pushback. Um, Gary Wormser, who's a very prominent Lyme disease expert, 
um, in the adult field um, has just published a paper recently saying that maybe this is a little bit too quick to make that recommendation, but it is, it's part of the Red Book now. And so when we see a Red Book change like that, it's typically based on some pretty good data um, for pediatricians to consider. Our group has used doxycycline for prophylaxis in children as well as under the age of eight for the treatment of Lyme disease, not just facial nerve palsy, on a fairly regular basis based on European and other data. And we've had no problems with tooth staining. And I think it's that's probably the biggest change when you think about the changes in the recommendation. You'll also see a much better set of recommendations for duration of therapy. I've joked with my group for years that if you want the worst duration of therapy table in the history of mankind, look up duration for Lyme disease. One of the IDSA recs says 10 to 28 days, which is the definition of a non-useful duration of therapy. Now the Red Book is getting a lot more regimented. And so it's a more universal recommendation for 14 days of therapy for many of the early and the disseminated manifestations. And then 28 days remains for arthritis, for which we have very good controlled data on. They also have said for erythema migrans, you can go as short as 10 days with doxycycline specifically. That will be another big change for folks, but I think the data behind it is fairly good. So in terms of hot ID topics, that's that's a big set of changes for folks to appreciate in terms of the, the drugs and the durations. Let me ask a question on that, Andy. And, you know, we're so lucky to have somebody who has both the scientific interest in Lyme, as you do, and experience with research, and you've been here the whole time during the epidemic. Um I mean, this is anecdotal, and we should always base our current evidence, but as you know, I spent many years in Tennessee where we did not have Lyme, but we had, you know, many, many, many cases of air leukiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And I personally treated hundreds of kids with doxycycline, and I've seen one child who, you know, had dental uh, discoloration that his dentist thought might have been due to it. So so I, I think the safety data, it sounds like, are really there. What's the advantage? Is there an advantage of using doxycycline for facial nerve palsy or for other central nervous system disease? So there, that's a great question. And I think that what we have seen here is that doxy and amoxicillin seem to have very similar efficacy. I've always liked doxycycline a bit better because its penetration into the central nervous system is at a much higher level. You know, we know that amoxicillin is like all penicillins. There's a big step down when you move from the gut to the bloodstream. And then there's a similarly big step down, like all penicillins, when you move from the bloodstream across the blood-brain barrier. Doxycycline is a much more lipophilic medicine, and so it moves much more readily into the gut. So the absorption of a dose is probably uh, five to 10 times better than the absorption of an amoxicillin dose. And the penetration into spinal fluid is excellent. So when I'm treating a central nervous system infection and syndrome, I'd like to have more drug in there. That's a theoretic advantage. I will tell you there are no studies to suggest that that theoretic advantage is reproducible in clinical studies. And I think the explanation for that is a basic science explanation. So when we see facial nerve palsy in Lyme disease, what we're observing is much more of an immunologic phenomenon than a direct infection. So when you think about Lyme meningitis, it's a great model for this. Lyme meningitis is a bacterial meningitis, which makes us all stand up and want to run out of the room and do a spinal tap and get ceftriaxone on board. But when you look at the CSF parameters and when you look at the symptoms, and this was well described by Steve Epps in the early parts of the 2000s in a great paper he published from his work at DuPont, Lyme meningitis looks like aseptic meningitis very, very similarly. And in fact, there are a few distinguishing features in terms of the um, uh, longer duration of symptoms at presentation, presence of facial nerve palsies. But really, it's, it's a great imitator of an of a, a, a aseptic meningitis. And so a lot of the clinical manifestations we see from Lyme are due to the fact that you have few bacteria, but a lot of immune response. And so that may explain why Amox does just as well in most studies um, as doxycycline. I still like doxycycline when I'm dealing with the central nervous system, but I think that the the recommendation to use uh, amoxicillin was never a bad one for the treatment of this infection. Well, that's very interesting. And in terms of just following that brief point you made about the meningitis, one of the papers you published, in fact, looked at a lot of the cases we had seen and found that presumably for the reason you just stated, that oral doxycycline was safe and effective compared to IV ceftriaxone for a long period of time. 
So that thank you for that that shout out. That's a page uh, paper from um, my group Brian Canfield and Santiago Lopez, who's um, now at the University of South Dakota. Uh, it's a paper that stands on the shoulders of the European work again. Uh, we were doing nothing more than imitating some lovely studies from Europe that showed in comparative studies of ceftriaxone and doxycycline that the outcomes were similar. We know that doxycycline is effective from the European studies. The other thing we know are pick lines are mischief makers when we send people home with them. And so you can pick lots of different rates. Um, your former co colleague, Buddy Creech, published a real nice study a few years back on the, the frequency of, of complications from uh, pick lines being in the 20 to 30 percent range. And so those might have been Buddy's own pick lines. They, they may have been, in fact. Um, so we know that pick lines give us no advantage here. Uh, and so when we made this move, that paper came from a, a look at the European data and to a certain extent taking a little bit of a chance because we were swimming upstream a bit. What we found over the 40 some patients in that study is that there was absolutely no difference between children treated all IV and children treated either all PO or mostly PO. Again, doxycycline gets in so well, it's like an IV medicine given by mouth. And so we were very comfortable with it. I think when you see further recommendations from the IDSA, you'll see a lot more reflection of the fact that there's a strong role, at least for downgrading children who are leaving the hospital from an IV medicine to an oral medicine. So I'm curious, Andy, why are we experiencing this epidemic and what happened with the vaccine? Oh, well, so, so those are two very interesting questions that are quite separate from each other. I'll take the second one about the vaccine first. The vaccine worked. It required some boosting um, and it could be, um, uh, you know, not 100 percent efficacious, but very high degree of efficacy. The vaccine went off market primarily because of lack of demand. Uh, it's not that it didn't work, but there was a lot of legal action around the vaccine and the company was not selling very many doses by the time it went off market in 2002. It is an effective vaccine. Uh, reformulated for pets, it still works. I will joke sometimes that if you want to get Lyme disease vaccine in Pittsburgh, it's easy. Leap in front of your dog at the last moment and your veterinarian <laughs> will deliver a dose to you. Um, you know, and, and it's a commentary on the fact that vaccine manufacturers, there are not that many of them anymore because there's a lot of risk associated. There's a lot of internet mythology about vaccines, as we all know. And to get a new vaccine to market, you really need people to weigh the balance of delivering a lot of doses and buying those doses and, and not suing you very often. And it's a, it's a commentary on how complex vaccine development is in the United States today. The first part of your question is, why do we have this epidemic is just fascinating. And, you know, ID doctors are are nerdy by nature, I think. And so to be able to sit here and watch the inter, the dynamics of a development of a vaccine, not a vaccine, I'm sorry, of an epidemic in this period of time has been amazing. I think there are contributions of climate, clearly, because ticks like to circulate in warm weather. And with the warming of the climate, even in Pennsylvania, that gives ticks more time to circulate. There's contributions of actually man-made ecosystems. So the Lyme disease epidemic, if you look at the CDC map, has a barrier along the Appalachian mountain chain, which makes a lot of sense. There's not a lot of animal passage over that mountain chain. It's passed over the Appalachians in one saddle area, which is the north central part of Pennsylvania. There is a large highway that runs through there. So there's a huge amount of clearing along that saddle region of the Appalachian mountains, and there's much more traffic of deer, ticks and white-footed mice through that area. So we think that a lot of this movement has been the movement of infected ticks across that saddle area, probably hanging on to many small mammals, and then getting into our area and taking over as a larger part of the infected tick population. Some great work done by uh, collaborators of mine at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Jamie Hutchinson and Tom Simmons group, showed that in the 90s, the western half of Pennsylvania had almost no Lyme disease in it at all. And then in 2015, Tom um, in particular published a paper in a, an entomology journal showing that every single county in Pennsylvania had at least 20, 30, or 40 percent of their ticks infected. So the western half of Pennsylvania had really caught fire with respect to infected ticks. One of the harder to answer questions that's probably all about ecology is it's not just that we have infected ticks, we have a lot more ticks. 
and what what contributions the bird population plays, the warming of the climate, and the predators in that area, we don't know. But there, there seem to be a lot more ticks out there. So more ticks, which are more likely to be infected, and lots of people building their nice houses out in the woods is a good explanation for an epidemic in our area. Boy, it's just really fascinating. I mean, for those of us who either have been here for a while or were here many years ago, it, it really is very different. And as you see, to both see it happening and to be able to, you know, get the clinical expertise and be able to do the research that you and your colleagues have done to help understand and manage that, uh, it's really remarkable. I, I would give a shout out to, you know, UPMC Children's is absolutely the epicenter of the study here. Um, I would give a shout out to my colleagues in the community. Community pediatricians were the proverbial canaries in the coal mine here, and particularly community practices in the northern half of our uh, western side of the state were the ones who fired up the first flares and really contacted us to say, boy, we're seeing a lot of kids with facial nerve palsies, with Lyme arthritis. And so the collaboration we've had with the very tight-knit network of pediatricians in this half of the state and our hospital and our division has been a really wonderful one. And I, I uh, want to pay a lot of tribute to them for being great partners in this. Uh, well said. So I would resent your remark about ID docs being nerdy, except sadly, I have to conf confess that it's true. Um, and I want to ask about something else you do. You mentioned you wear a lot of hats. You're a clinically practicing ID doc. You do clinical research on Lyme disease and on antibiotic resistance. Uh, you're the clinical director of the ID service. You do a lot of teaching and you're a co-director of the residency. But I, I wanted to hear about, you know, trying to recruit new doctors who are interested in a career like yours, who are interested in a research career, in short, future nerds. And what are you doing in that area? Future cool kids, let's call them. You know, <laughs> uh, One of the reasons that I was interested in taking on the role of the residency program director was a long passion I've had for training, but also an, an interest in training future pediatric scientists. I think that we've all identified for a long time, and all you need to do is Google or type into PubMed, you know, pediatric scientist workforce, and you will find a lot of opinion papers that state clearly we don't have enough. And in fact, in many places, we can see the, the supply is declining. Uh, and so this is a big problem for us. I think department chairs have identified it and, and national leaders have identified it, and it's a thorny problem. There are lots of economic forces that make this challenging. The ups and downs of funding from not just NIH, but lots of other places make this challenging. And so how do we do that? How do we keep people who are passionate about discovery work involved in discovery work? And so one of the things that is apparent to everyone who's involved in this is that the pipeline is so long that we lose a lot of people just through exhaustion. So, you know, the average age of an R01 funded researcher with an R01 being the, the biggest and kind of um, basic currency of research grant uh, is moved into the almost mid 40s. And so when it takes that long for people to reach that first mile post, which is so important for promotion and career success, that's a big problem. And so when we came together, when Steph and I became program directors, one of the first things we wanted to do was to create a space in the program where those people could thrive. And our theory behind it, and it's a theory that we're going to continue to test and compare with other institutions, is that the key way to do it is to keep them here, to be completely honest. So what we're doing that's different is that we upfront very um, clearly state we would like you for six years or six plus. Because we think if we have you through the whole residency to fellowship transition, we can create new curricula during that period of time to train you. Whether it's a non-standard pathway of the American board that shortens or changes up how you schedule your training, or more leadership development, which is part of our program, or just the, the close attention of the chair and other leaders within the department who are really looking over the mentoring and the career development of these residents and fellows very closely. We think lots of things will be needed to have a higher success rate than we have now. So we started this program um, almost as soon as I took over as a program director and then formalized it and put it under a, uh, 
a moniker called the Pediatric Scientist Development Program uh, about two and a half years ago when Terry Dermody took over as our chair. We now have eight residents and fellows in our pathway. We're hoping to have somewhere around 12 to 15 or 16 at any given time once we're completely staffed up. What we've seen is some wonderful things. Our folks are very dedicated and very interested in research and don't flag from that interest, which is good. So we're sustaining interest. Number two, we're getting them into interesting pathways that our fellowship programs are very appreciative of. And then finally, something that makes me very happy is that when we look at the clinical performance of these folks, what we have found are a cadre of folks who have a good scientific community and are also fantastic clinicians. So we are accomplishing several things at once. We're training great clinicians, but we're keeping them interested in research as well. And then in five to 10 years, when I do this podcast again, I'll tell you how those folks are doing when they make it to the important next steps, which is competing for funding and whether they're able to compete for independent funding and move out as scientists. This is a great, interesting question for us to answer. It's critically important. There are lots of tides that are pushing against people who are interested in doing discovery work in pediatrics. I think only with big commitments organizationally are we going to be able to fight against those tides. Well, I'm really grateful, Andy, that we have people like you and Jackie working on that. I mean, we're in Pittsburgh, where Jonas Salk discovered and invented the polio vaccine that has saved millions of lives around the world. So that's the kind of discovery that we need in pediatrics going forward. Yeah, our department chair does say, you know, we're bringing hope to kids who don't have hope now. And I think that's not a cliche. That's real. Um, Jackie Ho, thank you for bringing up Jackie. Jackie Ho, who's one of the nephrologists here at our hospital, is my co-director for this program. And I will say that um, uh, our team here for the Pediatric Scientist Development Program is a great one. Jackie's a great um, co-director. And we're hoping to kind of bring a number of these places together in the near future so we can talk about common ways to help um, pediatric residents find careers in discovery. Well, Andy, I'm so glad that you were able to join us uh, today on the podcast. I certainly enjoy working with you every day. We have a we have a very unique relationship, much like uh, my relationship with my co-host on this podcast, but I think it's one that benefits uh, both of us uh, and brings a lot of joy. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invite, guys. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with the new content. Leave a review and let us know what other topics you'd like experts to cover. And thanks for listening.